Good morning. Wow, good morning. I didn't even get a chance to say it. Wowee. So anything else you want to tell me? <laughs> I, I got to tell you, if you haven't thought about it, it's 85 days till Christmas. 85 days till Christmas. I think that's awesome. I love Christmas time because Christmas time is when the movies come out. And, um, you know, my wife will have special times of the day where she kind of goes away and watches all of her Hallmark you know, the new ones, the old ones, I mean, all of them. And, and then um, there are certain ones, though, that I, I just, I love to watch. I love It's a Wonderful Life. Don't you like that one? Woo! Like that one. That's, that's a great one. It, a Miracle on 34th Street, the old one, love that. Uh, I love uh, the, the shorter ones, you know, the Charlie Browns and the Rudolph and all those ones that I remember as a kid. But there's one that has come on the scene, you know, not all that long ago. It has been quite a while, though, now, believe it or not. Um, it, it, to me, it seems like it's the newest of all the, the classics now, and that's Elf. <laughs> and everybody loves to quote Elf, you know, uh, different things. But I think the greatest scene, one of the scenes that stuck out to me because it actually has something to do with what we're going to talk about today and it's a very important topic, I believe, for the church uh, to discuss and talk about. It's the scene in the movie where he is coming into New York City. You remember coming into New York City? He walks in, and if you haven't seen the movie yet, well, you know, pl bear with me. He walks into New York City after, after tangling with a raccoon, after, uh, you know, walking through the, the Lincoln Tunnel and all these things that he did. Um, he, he comes into the city, and he notices different things. Remember, you know, he finds chewing gum under the subway rails and stuff, and he starts putting it in his mouth and chewing it. And, and then uh, the one thing that I think is great, and this is what has to do with today, he comes across this little diner, diner, cafe, whatever you want to call it, and in, this, in the window is this flashing neon sign that says, World's Best Cup of Coffee. And if you remember this, he runs into there, busts into the door, and he says, congratulations, you did it. You've done it. You've made the best cup of coffee. Do you remember that? I, I loved that part. I thought that was really good. And it, stuck, it, it really stood out to me, stuck out to me. <laughs> it stood out to me that it's, it's like this because he got a dose of reality. He, he finds his girlfriend working at... at uh, whatever the Gimbals or, or Macy's, I can't remember which one it is. But anyway, one of the big stores in New York. I should know that by now. But anyway, um, he, he goes in and he meets her. And so he takes her out on a date. And they do all kinds of fun things. You know, they spin around in the doors and they do all kinds of stuff. But then the, the thing that was really great was he took her in to get a cup, the world's greatest cup of coffee. And she tastes it and goes, Bleh. you know. It's not the greatest cup of coffee, but they advertised it. They made it seem as if you could get the world's greatest cup of coffee there, right? I mean, that was the big thing, neon sign, you know, all of that. Well, you might say, Greg, what does that have to do with today? Well, I promise I will make full circle and come back to it at the end. But by the way, Merry Christmas. So... <laughs> Today, I want, to, I want to start out, and this is, this is the last installment of this series. Uh, this is the time where we actually, uh, we're going to wrap up, be rich, and I sure hope you're going to make it here tonight, because we have an incredible time together planned. It's going to be fun. We're going to sing a lot. We are going to sing some of those favorite songs we all love to sing, but I hope you'll be here because we're going to celebrate what Be Rich has been over the last few weeks and what God has done. We're going to celebrate him tonight. That's really what we're celebrating. We're celebrating everything that God is to us and how rich we are to know him. Uh, and so it's going to be a lot of fun tonight and, and being able to give away some gifts and things to people that need them so desperately. And because of our generosity and your generosity of all that's happened here, it's just going to be great. But I I've, I hope that as we've done Be Rich this year, that it has helped us focus on something not just about doing a campaign that's once a year. I hope it's brought focus to us to talk about something that should be a part of our lives all the time. And it should be something that happens all year long. We should be rich all year long. And so I want to ask the question I've asked you every week. 
okay? If you've been here, if you've been watching, uh, you've, you've seen this question over and over again. And I hope you've contemplated this. But what does it really mean to be the church in the world today? I mean, what's it really mean to be the church in the world today? I mean, because there's so many things that are going on, and, and quite honestly, the church is being challenged. I believe the church is being challenged in ways that we have not seen before in our time. In the time that we've all lived, we're going to continue to see the church challenged. The things we believe, the things that we, we stand for, the things that we are giving our lives to, and to say that we're willing to follow this one who, who we, we claim came here to this earth, died and rose again to give us new life and to forgive our sin. I mean, that in itself is a unique message. It should be earth-changing, and it should be history-making all the time because of the depth of that story. And so when I think about it, I, I think to myself, a world, we want the world to be a, a place where people that are, are not a part of us, that are skeptical of what we believe, they're skeptical of it, would be envious because of how well we treat each other. And they would be amazed at how well we treat them. I know that, uh, you know, at times it seems as if maybe the word love is overdone, and maybe it is. Maybe some people are taking advantage of it, but I will tell you this, that it was at the core of what Jesus preached. Even when he was giving truth, even when he was hitting them hard with things that are real, Jesus talked about love, and he did it in love. And so everything we do in this, this last time we're together to talk about Be Rich this year is all about loving in a way that Jesus wanted us to. So if we're talking about the church, we're talking about this, a, a group of believers, of Jesus followers, partnering in a local area to make a difference because his message and his mission. That's why we are, we're, we're Jesus followers, people who believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we're willing to do whatever he says. We're willing to follow him. We're willing to do what he wants from us. That's what it means to follow Jesus. You may, you may believe in Jesus, but to follow is much different. It is giving your life to it. And so doing that, it means that that group of Jesus followers need to partner together We've talked a lot about what it means to, you know, and, and in tradition of churches that there's this thing called membership. And many people have started to, tr to treat it, though, as if it's kind of a, a thing that gives you rights instead of responsibilities. See, when Jesus, I think, formed the church and what I, I see him pointing in the right direction and all the ones that helped him set up, all of his disciples, the ones that were his followers that saw him alive after his resurrection, their whole idea was is that we would partner together. We would need each other. It's not something that we're consumers to find a place, a church uh, that has a cool building and a, and a lot of cool programs and all those things which are necessary. It's needed to have that, but it's not what the core of the church really is. The church is a group of people that follow Jesus. And so for us to make a difference because of his message and his mission, we have to keep some things in mind. We have to have a, a pathway forward. We have to be led in a way that helps us. Every one of us need to be led. And we get the idea for Be Rich and what the church ought to look like from a letter that was written to a young pastor, and it's 1 Timothy, and it's chapter 6, and this is what it says, command them or actually lead them, and really lead them strongly would be the best way to say it, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I don't know if you've memorized this verse by now, but I've said it week after week. So I would hope that maybe it's kind of stuck with you, that you have started to understand it or know what it is. But for us to be rich, it's not to be rich wealthy or to have those kind of things. It's not to name it and claim it that we should have it because we're, we're Christians. We should have everything. We no, 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 no. It, it actually has everything to do with how we conduct our lives, how we live our lives every day, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share because that's not really happening that much in our culture today. It's not happening that much. It would stand out, and it does stand out when we do this, when a church decides to take an offering and then give 100% of it away, not keeping any of, any of it in 
It's always thinking of giving it away and everything. That's what the church ought to be doing. So when we think of it, we don't think of us just being members together. We think of it as partners. Partners. Partners where we link arms and we have responsibilities for each other. You're responsible to me. I'm responsible to you. We are responsible for each other. And remember, we want to be in a world where those that are skeptical of what we believe are, are just bewildered. They're like, I can't understand this, how well they treat each other. There's no group of people treating each other like that. And they're amazed at how well we treat them. Even though that some might think that the church has this bar that you got to jump over or a hoop you got to go through to be a part of it, yes, we want people to come here to find Jesus. That's really the whole point. And so for us to do that, we got to remember we're partners together to make that happen. And so that's what brings us to this. So what's a partner do? Well, being rich, and that's what we've talked about all this time, and I haven't heard you cheer one time, so can we do it this time and then don't do it again? All right? If I say be rich, much better. All right, I like that. Now, that gives me some confidence you're with me here this morning. And, and what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to give. Every person that is a follower of Jesus, that is attached to a local church, should engage themselves by setting aside a percentage of their income to give to make the church function and to do the things, to give the church opportunities. And when we pool our money, you might say, well, I give to a lot of things, but when we pool our money together, we do things like buy a car for a pastor in Cuba. We help a, a family violence prevention center pull together uh, the needs they have and to be able to do a much better job. An organization that usually the church overlooks but we get a chance to be involved with them, and who knows where God will take that after we've done it. In the past, we've worked with the food pantry and the homeless liaison in Fairborn. There's been so many things. You pack boxes. A church that gives has sets money aside to go pack a box for teachers and to make sure they've got what they need and, and kids that go home hungry from school. See, those, those are the kind of things that happen. You give time that where you go out and you help somebody who's struggled through a situation in their home or their neighborhood and they're needing help. See, that's, that's what it is. We give and we serve. This, uh, you got served project things that we're doing. Unbelievable stuff that you guys are signing up and you've nominated some people who are really in need. And a lot of them are skeptical of what we believe but they are kind of on the edge of their seat to see if we really want to back up what we say. And they're, they're, in, they're, 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 they're amazed at how well we treat them. That's, that's what it's about. And then loving. And last week we talked about what it meant to love. Loving each other, making sure that we have a small group of people that we can connect with and grow with in our faith and making sure that we're, we're, we're studying the Bible, the scriptures together, that we're praying together and that we're caring for each other. But this week, we jump to a new one. Before I reveal it, I wanna ask you a question, all right? Why did you come here? And I mean now, here being this place. Why did you come here? What to, And I don't mean just this morning. I mean, I'm talking about the first time that you came here. Why did you come here? What brought you to this place? What made you think this was the place to come? Why would this be better than, let's say, any of the other churches in the area? What brought you here? And there are a lot of great churches in our area. I, I, this is not about that at all. But what brought you here? And I guess the, the other thing would be, more than likely, somebody brought you along with them or told you about it or they passed it on to you or they explained it to you. Who invited you? Who invited you to come? Who was that person that, that kind of went out there and, and, and maybe told you about the church or they, they were doing something or they wore one of their shirts? Maybe they had a shirt that had four on it or they had a Give, Serve, Love or an FSM or a kid's street, or something like that. They had one of those shirts on, and you're wearing it out there. Or maybe you had a, a something, a, a four bumper sticker, you know, or maybe you had something that we've done in the past that has pointed people that you go to this, this place where this group of people, Fair Creek, 
gets together. Who invited you? Who invited you? You know, I, I look at this and I think to myself, many of us, we're up against all kinds of things that we see in our life. And I just, I want to tell you that many people are looking for that experience. They're looking for something. People are more spiritually oriented now than ever before. And you might say that seems weird because it seems as if there's pushback against the church, but there's not against God necessarily. Although I heard a statistic today that 87% of Americans, and this comes from a reliable source, a poll that was given, and it scared me to death. It actually, it, it actually shook me, and I hope it shakes you, that 87% of people in the United States today do not believe there's a God. I, I, I questioned it at first. I went back and I looked and I started comparing numbers. But when you consider that our population is well into the 300 million and you start to take and extract how many people are in different denominations of churches and people who claim Christianity, even that 87% though of people. And you know what? That's changed. That number has risen over the last four years. You know anything that's happened over the last four years that might make people skeptical of whether a, a God exists? If they don't know where that source is, if they don't know who he is, or they have no way to have anybody to point them to him, it's going to be difficult. So I want to tell you this. They're looking for experience. They're looking for an opportunity to find people who are excited about God and know, who, know him, know him personally. So I would tell you, an experience is always better than an explanation. Always. An experience is always better than an explanation. A lot of us think that for us to actually have any input or influence into the life of someone who is not churched, and for the sake of terms today, we'll say unchurched. For us to have any kind of input into their life or influence, we sometimes think that we've got to have this well-presented explanation. Well, I'm going to tell you that it starts with something different. It starts with an investment in the life of someone you know. That's where it starts. And an investment means that you're taking the time, you're stopping what you're doing, your regular routine. Maybe you're going to even go out of your way a little bit, but you're going to care for someone or you're going to invest time in someone. It may be your neighbor, your coworker, a student, fellow student that you there, some, a teammate, somebody that you are close to. Maybe a family member. But all of that is so important, we have to remember that an investment, it's the best investment you'll make. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this. So I want to take you to a story that may be familiar to many of you, but it is so, so in your face about what we should be doing and how important it is. It's a story where Jesus went out of his way on a trip to get a drink of water. He went way out of his way to get a drink of water. And many of his disciples that were walking with him and were traveling with him were un could not understand, why are we going that way? That's out of the way. I don't want to go that way. Matter of fact, there are people in that area we don't like. There are people in that area we disagree with. We don't like them. We actually hate them and loathe them. And they do us. Why would we do this? Jesus says, you know what? Just come with me. I'll show you. So I take you to John chapter 4 beginning in verse 28, and this is what happens. Then leaving her water jar, there was a woman where Jesus went to get the drink of water. And she was there talking and interacting with him, and he gave her all kinds of information about her, but he didn't have to do this. He actually went there on purpose to meet this woman because he knew that he would be able to talk to her about the greatest need in her life. And she what, right from the beginning, it was like, you've got you've to see this in her life. She, she was so excited about meeting Jesus, and this is why. It goes on. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man. Come see a man. Jesus had spoken things to her that amazed her. He knew her. He was invested. He actually went out of his way to do what was ever necessary. And once it happened, 
She went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? This group of people were the Samaritans, and they, they honestly had, had given up on being included into this. They were, they were giving up. They were told by the Jews, you'll never have a Messiah. There will never be. But the Messiah would know people this way. And when we say Messiah, that means he was the promised one who would come and be the deliverer from sin. And so when they saw it, it was like, come see a man. You won't believe this. He told me everything about me, which he did. In describing things to her, he was telling her all about her life. He was invested. He was telling her the things that she knew. And it overwhelmed her. You've got to come. He, she went running to tell everybody. She went running to tell everybody. And so it, it, it goes on, the passage goes on, it says, they came out of the town and made their way toward him. They wanted to hear. They were amazed at what she had said because her life, everyone there knew what her life was like, and Jesus made an investment in her, was willing to do what was ever necessary to reach out to her and bring her in. And she goes out saying, this guy knew me. And he still spent time. If he's the Messiah, he spent time with me. He knew me. He invested in me. He was willing to do what was ever necessary. What she do? She turns around and goes and invites everybody. She invites all the town that knew her. You've got to come and see this man. I'm here to tell you today that an invitation can change everything. An invitation can change everything. It's one thing to invest in other people's lives, and, and hopefully they definitely will see you being the hands and feet of Jesus. But it's another thing when we actually launch out and say, come and see. Come and see with me. I, I, want you to, I want you to have an experience like I have. I want you to understand what I'm talking about here. I'm excited about this, and I want you to know. So would you come with me? Would you be a part of this with me? And we've kind of lulled ourselves. I think the church has lulled ourselves to sleep a little bit, thinking that, you know, that's really not our job to do. You know, doesn't God take care of all that? And, and really, isn't that a private matter? Well, not according to the way Jesus did things. When Jesus went around, he was making sure everybody, did, everybody talked about it, and then he was passing it on. And then the last thing he said was go out and make as many disciples as possible. Any of you uh, know what I, when I say the, the Chosen, the mini-series that you can watch either online or sometimes you can pick it up on there? If you've not seen it yet, it's incredible, all right? Uh, you know, I'll be honest, I've watched all kinds of movies and things about the life of Jesus and the life of his disciples, and quite honestly, they've been cheesy to the point that I didn't want to, <laughs> you know, invite people to watch it. This one is good stuff. And, you know, in the midst of maybe some liberties, it, it, they, they used some dialogue between the disciples and Jesus, where the disciples said, do you, you know, who do we invite to come to this thing? Who do we invite to come in? And he said, invite as many as you can, and I'll sort it all out later. I love that. You see, we sometimes think, oh, that person wouldn't, that person wouldn't, that person wouldn't. If I invited them, they'd never come, I, you know. Well, I got to tell you something. It's not for us to choose. It's just for us to go out and say, I, I want you to come with me. Bring in as many as possible. Well, the, it goes on, the passage goes on, and this was the impl implications of the invitation to so many people. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Her story was what stood out. He told me everything I did. <laughs> it goes on, it says, so many I'm sorry, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. This, you're talking about an investment, an investment of time. And because of his words, many more became believers. Because of what he did, because of his investment in their life, because he stuck around in an environment where most people wouldn't have wanted somebody who was Jewish to be there in the midst of a bunch of Samaritans, they... You know, but he was willing to do that. That's his heart. That's his heart. So I, I want to want to give you a saying here, and I worked hard to craft this. It rhymes a little, but it's really true. People are likely to believe it's true if what you tell them is true for you. 
See, if it's true for us, so I, I'm going to ask you again. I mean, it's going to be important for all of us. It's important for all of us to take this seriously. See, the greatest thing we can do is love other people is to invest in them and then invite them to come and see. Invite them to come and be a part of what we're experiencing, what you're experiencing. That's what's going to be the thing that draws people is, is your story, the thing that you have seen God do in your life. And even if, it's, even if it's at a point right now where you're like, I don't know if I have much of a story, if things aren't good right now or whatever, let me just tell you something. Start investing in someone's life and see if God doesn't give you more story than you think you have to be able to share it. You know what? <clears throat> we talk a lot around here about our mission and vision. And our mission and vision, it, it, it's, it's written uh, on walls out there. And actually, one of them, we, we need to change the wording of it just a little bit because we've changed what we've said even since COVID based on the things that are necessary in our world and our environments that we live in. But this is the key. Our mission is to lead people into a life, or I'm sorry, <laughs> lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's our mission, then our vision is, is to be a church that unchurched people love. They love it because we engage them. We want them to be here. We want them to feel like this is a place they can find that experience that they need so desperately. People who maybe have been hurt by the church in the past or somebody who has never been in, the, in, a, in a church building where a church meets. They've never been in a building like that. And, and so they, they just don't know what to do with that. But if they had a friend, if they had somebody who had invested in their life that they trusted, then it would happen. Let me just tell you, for all of us as partners, it will take all of us to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. It will take all of us to do this. It will take all of us to encourage people in their faith. It will incur it's going to take all of us to provide environments that are irresistible to people. And I'd even go further. It will take all of us to be a church that unchurched people love. We can't be a place where the first thing we do is jump to judgment. Our role is, is to say, I need to see them the same way Jesus sees them. Anybody who comes, your friend, you want to be able to bring a friend. You want to know that they're going to be welcomed. You got to know that they're going to do this. Listen, it's going to take all of us. Listen, if we don't do this, and I want you to hear this the right way, all right? But if we don't do this and we don't do it properly, if we don't show this kind of love, if we're not be rich in this way, I'm going to tell you something. We're sunk. In this world with 87% of the population saying they don't believe in God or are skeptical of God, let me just tell you something. If the church stands by and idly just does nothing, talks a good talk, but never really does anything about it, imagine this. So I'm just going to tell you, this is, this is the deal. It all, starts, it all starts with an investment in the life of someone you know and an invitation to come and see with you. They need to have an invitation they need to, to see you invest in their life so that they trust you. And listen, don't make your friend or the person you sit with in school or the next door neighbor, don't make them a project. Anybody here want to be somebody's project? No, I don't want to be anybody's project. That degrades me. That makes me feel low. It makes me, it doesn't tell me that you care. We, we're not doing this to make people our project. It's, it's also not to get points. You don't get extra points for this, okay? This is just what Jesus' followers do that partner with other, other people in the local church. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And so I have a little plan for you. You might say, I just don't know if I could ever just approach somebody <laughs> and start to do some of this. Well, I have, have three things that you can learn today. They're called the three knots, okay? The three knots, okay? Say it with me. The three knots. I want everybody to memorize these before you leave today. When you're having conversations with people, and first, you're going to be investing in them. You're going to know them. You're not just going to go up and knock, the, knock on the door of a neighbor who you've never met yet, okay? The one that the dog comes over and leaves his business in your yard, you know what I'm talking about, okay? You haven't met them yet. 
The things that you've thought about them are not probably the best, maybe. They don't cut the grass with the same way you do. Or they don't, you know. Or maybe it's that coworker that's in the cubicle next to you that has an annoying habit, you know. I don't know what the annoying habit would be. Anybody have anybody like that in your life? Sure you do. You have somebody. Or maybe they don't have any. You just like them. They're fun. It's great to be around them. Somebody you, you, know, you hang out with at school. You see them in between classes. They're always, you know, you're always laughing and juggling with them. You always have a good time. Whatever it may be, okay? But you're looking for this in the conversation. Because when you hear this, this gives you an opportunity then to invite them. Number one is this, not in church. They don't go to church. I just want to say this. Please don't try to get somebody who's going to a good church to come here. Okay? We're not trying to sheep steal, if you will. That's the old terminology. You know, we're not trying to get people who are going to a good church to come here. All right? They're going to church. All right? They're going. They're a part of a church. We're not trying to tell them, well, ours is better than that, you know. We, we serve Dunkin' Donuts coffee here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not, that's not the point. Do you know that in our area, within just a five-mile radius, probably about 90,000 people live here? I don't think we have to go to people who are already there. Now, it may be that we do that because we're more comfortable talking to people that go to church already. Okay? I'm going to tell you, wave and smile at them. God bless you. You know, I'm sure he already has, you know. Move on to the people who need to hear that and need to see the investment in their life. So you're looking for people that are not in church, okay? That's the ones that you're, you're going for. So what's the first not? Not in church. Good. All right, man. Good, good. All right. The next one is not going well. Something in their life is not going well. One of the things that God uses to grow our faith is pivotal circumstances, Things that happen to us, and when things are tough and when things are not going well, that opens a door. And it may be that you're just there consoling. It may be that you bring them a meal. It may mean that you step in and help them do something that they need to help with. But you're looking for somebody that things aren't going well for them. You're listening for that. You're listening for when things don't go well in their life. The friends around you, the people around you, you're looking for that. When that happens there, you're saying, okay, I, I know what I can do here. I can introduce them to one that can walk them through it and give them peace and everything. And the best way I can do it is invest in them and invite them. Why don't you come to, why don't you come to Fair Creek with me? Why don't you see what we're doing here? Why don't you just come and experience it once? And then not prepared for, okay? Not prepared for losing their job. Not prepared for a family member to die. Not prepared for their, their kid to do something and get into trouble. Not prepared for uh, losing a bunch of money. Not prepared for hearing the C word when going to the doctor. Not prepared for something that is catastrophic in their life. Something that they're just not prepared for. Or... They hear that they may be, you know, having, having some issues in the, in the family and, and everything, but they're just, they weren't prepared for it. They're not prepared for it. Well, maybe a friend stepping into their life and saying, hey, listen, can I, can I invite you to be something that, that I'm a part of and, and experience it so that you can see that it's the three knots. What are they? Church, Church not, and not. Okay. Remember these. You're listening for them. You're looking for them. And when you see your friends or people that are around you that are going through something like that, that's who you invite. Okay? See, I want to just tell you, if you're a partner with the local church, partners invest and invite. They invest and they invite. Something that is a responsibility that we all have. And if we don't do it, we're sunk. It's important for us. I'll tell you what, it changes your life when you invite someone and they find Jesus, or Jesus finds them, really. When Jesus finds them and you see that change in their life, it, it just radically changes your own life. So 
I want to remind you, how did you get here and who invited you? How did your relationship with Jesus start? How did that all happen? Did somebody invest in you and then invite you? That's, that's a big part of this. I take you back to the question I started with. And this is big. What does it really mean to be the church in our world today? What's it really mean? I take you all the way back to the beginning. You know, I say, when's he ever going to talk about Elf? You see, this cafe in New York City put a neon sign flashing out in front that they had the world's best cup of coffee. When in fact, they really didn't. Just because you say you do something or something's important or it's a part of who you are doesn't mean that it really happens. Just because when in there, it was a dose of reality for Elf. I mean, he hurt his girlfriend. <laughs> you know, yuck. It's awful. I think she called it a crappy cup of coffee. You don't advertise that on the sign. Okay. Got to tell you this. You see, I think for a long time, the church in America, maybe even the church in other places around the world, the church has, has advertised and said we're all about reaching people who are unchurched, people who don't know Jesus. We've put out the flashing neon sign, you know, that we do this. We even send money around the world to see people come to Jesus. But when it comes to actually doing it, to where it really becomes a reality, and quite honestly, I believe it's an act of obedience. It's something that is passionate. It beats in my heart. It runs through my veins. To see this church be this kind of place that invests in people's lives and invite. We don't just say we do it. We don't just say with a neon sign, all are welcome, please come here. But we do nothing about it to invite them. We don't interact with people. We kind of hunker down and stay away. Or when we do, we put on a completely different face so no one will know that we actually go to church. But you see, if we're really going to have the world's best message and experience, that if we say it, it should be a part of us. So we've been, we've been exercising this Be Rich Projects concept. We've been doing this for, for a while. And all of these things, it really comes down to, to this. We need to be rich all year long. Please don't let us just do this for four weeks and then be done. Don't go just do your project. Think about it all the time. How can I invest in this person's life and this person's life and this person's life so that I can invite them to come and to be part of this? Imagine what God does with that. Imagine what God does with a church, a group of followers on your chairs close to you. There are these. Pick them up. Wave them at me. Tell me you've got them. Okay? And if you don't have any close to you, there's empty seats around you close by enough that you could get one. I want everybody to go home with two of these because you have somebody you know. This is the next series. The next series that we'll be starting beginning next week. And this whole idea of how the church now takes what we have done and being rich, how do we go into a culture that seems to be just full of scary stuff? Especially for some of us who, you know, we've kind of lived that isolated life. We've insulated ourselves from all the things that are going on around us and we, it's hard for us to encounter it. And when we do, we freak out a little bit. Let me just tell you something. Don't freak out. Let's talk about it together. But I want to tell you that as a part of this, this is a great opportunity to invite a friend who might be skeptical of what you believe or what we believe. But they'd be amazed at how well we treat each other and how well we treat them when they come. And actually, as a part of this, beginning on the Monday night, a week from tomorrow night, we're going to be having and hosting a thing. Ask anything, okay? Ask any kind of question you want. We're going to host it out on the patio. The fire pits will be going. Cafe lights will be up, you know. We'll have something warm to drink. All of that, invite your friends to come to something like that. And then on the back of this card is also the invitation to starting point. And Matt already told you, bring somebody and, and host them. Listen, if we don't do this kind of stuff, we're sunk. We're sunk. 
We've got a big flashing neon sign out in front. We care. We want people to know Jesus. But when, they, when, when we try to do it, or it, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Um, I, know that, I know that this is an important part of, of all that we can, we can do together. We give you this as a tool. You don't have to have a card to invite people. It's not a ticket. But it does give you the opportunity to show them and tell them where you go. And you want to invite them to come and to be a part of it. So if we're going to be rich, it's going to take us loving by investing and inviting. And if we're going to partner together, I believe God could do amazing things. Would blow our minds if we do this. Let's do this together. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if God filled this place two, three? What if we had to do it four times on a weekend or a Sunday because we had invited so many people to join us? It can happen. I'm sure the worship team right now is saying, oh, God, make it slow. <laughs> but I want to tell you, it would be amazing. We'd see somebody baptized every week. We'd see people that you wouldn't even thought of coming to know him. So we've prepared scary stuff in a way that makes it easy for you to invite them. So we want you to have a little taste of what it'll be like. Watch this. <laughs> oh, you scared me. What are you doing? I'm doing research. Research about what? Scary stuff. Oh, like kids? No, not at all. No, I, I, I think there's a lot of scary stuff in the culture today, and I think we should be talking about it. So why am I here? Well, I thought two would be better. You know, or paranormals. <sighs> hey, where'd you go? Hey. Hey, don't leave me here. Ah. <laughs> Invest and invite, church. Let's see what God does. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you here tonight.